Okay, we're recording. You can go ahead. Hello, everyone. It is Thursday, June 1st. Uh, welcome to the Town Services and Outreach <clears throat> Committee meeting. This meeting is being recorded. This meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. <clears throat> no in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the meetings in real time via technological means. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, call to order and make sure everyone can <clears throat> hear and be heard. So, Anna. Present. Also, I think Paul is stuck in the audience, but present. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, Bandy. Bandy. I'm here. I'm here. Kelly, can you hear us? I can. You sound great. Yeah. <laughs> and Athena, I'm hearing you. Oh, sorry about that. I'll meet. I see him. I see his name. There he is. Okay. Welcome, Paul. Can you hear us? I can. Okay, we can hear you. All right, so we'll move right in. I'm not sure that we have. Oh, it looks like we may have someone. Do we have anyone with us who would like to make a public comment? If you do, please raise your hand and we will bring you in where you are welcome to have the floor for up to three minutes. <clears throat> I see. Let's see. Welcome, Darcy Dumont. The floor is yours. Can you hear us, Darcy? We see you with your hand Darcy, up. It looks like you're muted. Yes, you're muted, Darcy. Sorry about that. Let's see. The floor is yours. Welcome. Okay. Hi. Uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, my name is Darcy Dumont, and I live in District 3. I'm a member of Zero Waste Amherst, the official community sponsor of the Waste Hauler Bylaw Amendment proposal to change to a contract with the hauler, which would include the provision of curbside compost pickup. Um, so I urge you uh, to take action on the bylaw amendment proposal um, sooner than later so that the council can act to vote on adoption by early summer. Um, the matter was referred to this committee 10 months ago in August of last year, and the DEP technical assistance grant was awarded six months ago. Um, the Board of Health urged the council to act a year and a half ago and reminded you both in June of 2022 and last month to try to get it done. Um, this proposal is really so easy to support. It's a win-win for air quality, for the climate, and for residents' pocketbooks. The results of the trash, recycling, and compost survey were clear, respondents using a USA Waste and Recycling, using USA Waste and Recycling are paying exorbitant amounts and getting no pay as you throw, quote unquote, waste reduction. We could reduce our waste by much more than 40% by the combination of using a pay as you throw system and the compost diversion. If USA is touting its recycling facility, all the more reason that it will be able to fare well in a contract bidding process. We need a contract to ensure waste reduction, to reduce prices, and to provide transparency for customers. Again, a huge number of local organizations support this proposal. We have lots of evidence that it'll save residents money. And please, 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 let's get it going. Thank you so much. Thank you, Darcy, and I'm sure you're aware that the Hauler Bylaw has another <coughs> update this evening. Is there anyone else? 
in our audience that would like to make comment. Okay, so well, what do you know? We are actually moving on to that update. Uh, so, Town Manager Paul Bachelman, I will hand the floor over to you. Shalini, did you have a question first? Yeah, our, one other sponsor of this uh, bylaw is uh, in the audience, Jennifer Taub. I wonder if you want to invite her in for this update. Jennifer, would you like to join us? You're more than welcome to join us for this update. I take that as a yes. Welcome, Jennifer. Sure. Okay, thank you. I did. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, all the floor is yours. Thank you. So a quick update. The um, the ball is in the court of the DPW. This Susan Waite has done her piece of the puzzle. Um, now our next step is to get the RFI out. Uh, RFI out, we had said we would get that out by the end of June, which we will do. Um, I anticipate um, Guilford to be finalizing that. I met with him today on it over the next week or two. Um, and then we will put that out. The RFI, as you know, is what we, where we um, utilize a process to collect information about the interest of vendors who might want to bid on our um, profile of trash and collections. So, um, so that's where we are. And so again, that's just an update on where, um, as we are making progress on this. Thank you, Paul. Were there any questions for Paul? Andy? Yes. Um, there was one thing that I wanted to ask about. I'm sorry that Guilford is uh, not joining us tonight. I was hoping that he would. At the Finance Committee meeting, when he presented um, uh, the, on the budgets for DPW and the Enterprise Funds, um, without being asked, he mentioned when we were talking about the Solid Waste Enterprise Fund, that he did not anticipate that the uh, transfer station would continue to function as an alternative means by which uh, people can choose to dispose of trash in addition to whatever is arranged for home pickup. And uh, because it was a, a meeting that was unrelated to the topic, um, I felt like it was not an appropriate point to have a significant discussion about it because we were heavily into the entire DPW and um, Enterprise Fund's budget and the water and sewer rates, and there was too much on the plate already. But I was concerned about that because I don't think that that was the intention of um, the co-sponsors at any time as being necessarily something that was envisioned because we know that a lot of residents uh, use the uh, transfer station now. And if they could pay less at the transfer station than participating in home pickup, that uh, they would want to do so. So um, I just wanted to at least uh, bring that up to the committee is something that I would like to have a better understanding of um, what was behind that statement. Um, and um, I know that um, Anna was also present at that meeting and um, that I, but I don't think that she has anything to add, but I don't, I think that was pretty much it. So I just wanted to raise that point. I, I agree with you, Andy. I think there's a lot of interest in maintaining the transfer station. The town and its services, along with the schools, also um, has to decide what it's going to do with its trash right now. That those that trash goes to the transfer station um, as it is. So if we didn't operate the transfer station, um, there's different options available that it would be operated just for town trash, municipal trash that'd be open to the public. Um, so I don't think there's any decisions on that. Um, I think those are the types of the RFI that we'd want to collect information on. If you do, if you get a contract, would you um, require that the transfer station be closed in order to you have a, in order for you to have a, a 
greater market share? That's one of the, the types of questions we want to hear from vendors on that. Um, so, but I don't think that's a decision for sure because that's that's right, really a, a much, I'm not sure what was behind his statement. I'll find out what he's meant by that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Jennifer, did you have a question or anything that you wanted to add? Um, thank you. I, I just wanted to ask, I guess, uh, and it may have, I apologize if you went over to another meeting where I wasn't present, but um, if the RFI is going out in June, what would be the anticipated time frame going forward? Like yeah, so we typically would give some people uh, 30 days to respond to an RFI, and then that information, anybody who would respond to it um, would come back. We could make that a little bit shorter, but um, you're, you're, the more time you give folks, the more likely you are to get responses. And then that information gets collected and analyzed. And then when would we see the RFP going out? Yeah, I think there's some decisions about what to put in the RFP. That's why you would do an RFI to figure out what right. you're going to put in the yeah. RFP. Yeah. And if that's what, I mean, first off, the council has to decide if it wants to do this or not, right? That's the that's first major decision. Because uh, we don't want to do an RFP unless there's an appropriation available to support the work. And, and, um, unless it's strictly an RFP that says you, you're going to have the access to the town um, to the town households to um, collect trash and, and recycling and composting. I think the, the one of the ideas is to get a more comprehensive approach to collections um, with with um, composting and recycling and then to have greater you know sort of if, if we can achieve everything that um, uh, Darcy said that would be a, a great win for the town. Jennifer, your hand is still up. Oh, sorry. Yeah, question? so I guess I'm just trying to, um, so uh, I assume that the RF, we get information responses in the, to the RFI yep. that would give more information to put in the RFP. But now it sounds like, so in terms of, you know, the steps, kind of the time frame, or just not time frame, but timeline, after we get the RFI responses, there'll be a report to TSO and then yep. TSO will go back to the council. Is that? Yeah, I, I think that would most likely be the path, right? The information would be, is right now this whole bylaw, it's it was before the council, before the TSO committee is the bylaw. Um, and so this would, the RFI information will be come back to the, um, to the TSO committee. Right, and then the council, so there, do we anticipate like the council make a decision about whether to go forward with the RFP? I'm just trying to get. It, it, it'll just it'll depend on what the TSO committee wants to do with it. The okay. Information. Okay. And then the last question: Will um, does will the RFI include um, ask information about pricing, or will that be for the RFP? Um, I don't know if she collected information on the pricing, but I, I can ask that question. I mean, that's okay. that's a key piece of it, right? We want to see right. what the pricing would look like. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. <clears throat> Shalini. As far as pricing goes, Paul, I, my memory is that we talked about it and it's not going to be asked because um, I don't know. I don't remember the why, why we're not going to ask that, but that was what was shared with us is that um, we are not going to, not that I'm saying we shouldn't. I mean, if we can get to ask that, but that's what we were told. We're not going to get the price. However, what Susan did say is that based on her experience and she has data, she could share with us about comparable rates in the area. No town will obviously be same as us, but uh, so I think now that her part is done with the um, RFI, I wonder if she could then start working with TSO to share some of the data she has in addressing some of the questions. So whether, you know, who are going to be the haulers who are interested, uh, what will they provide, what services, transparency, data, all of that will come through the RFI and we can wait for that. But some of the other questions that are there right now, um, I think if Susan can start working with TSO, that would be really helpful. Yeah, while well, we still have her. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and she's here till end of June, is it? Yes. So then the final report would come from DPW and not her? She's she's our regional coordinator for, for solid waste for DEP, so I'm sure she would help us out. 
Okay, and then if you're expecting the RFIs to come back by July 30th, by when can we put down a date? Or do you want to consult with DPW and let us know what the date will be for the report? So since Guilford couldn't be here tonight, so maybe that's a, your next TSO meeting, we put that on the agenda for Susan and Guilford to be there. Okay, because I think we want uh, with Anika to plan out our TSO time in terms of when TSO wants to discuss this, and then we probably want to share this information with the public. Yep, absolutely. The public forum ahead of time and really let all the counselors and everyone know to reach out. And of course, Zero Waste can send um, the information out that what we've collected. And so all of those steps uh, can be planned accordingly then. And yes, thank you, Sean. And again, we do have this item as um, one of the reasons why it is an ongoing agenda item. Uh, Andy. Yeah, I did have one more thing that I thought about regarding the RFI. And um, that is, uh, Paul, do you know whether there's anything um, in there about alternatives between weekly and biweekly um, trash pickup as being an RFI question? as to how it might affect rates. And the reason that I ask that question is that um, we keep uh, being um, told about South Hadley being uh, uh, much less expensive after um, a competitive process, but it turns out that you can't compare it very well because it's, a, it's an every other week pickup and not a weekly pickup. And uh, that substantially reduces the cost for the hauler because uh, then we need half the number of um, trucks running. Uh, and uh, when I've talked with um, uh, somebody from Zero who, who works with Zero Waste Amherst uh, and, uh, and mentioned that to him, uh, he indicated that. Uh, it's um, not uncommon to have every other week pick up and that it actually serves other purposes and uh, uh, similar to um, pays you throw it's a it's a waste reduction technique uh, so i didn't know if that was part of the rfi recommendation and if not I'd be curious to know why not yeah i believe it is but i'll double check on it andy thank you Thank you, Andy. Uh, Sean. Yeah, Paul, can I get another? I'll let you finish, make your notes first. Yep. I guess you're good right now and <laughs> multitasking. Um, but uh, I don't know. I have the dates from last time about when we were going to send it out. And I'm sure there's a lot deep uh, DPW is dealing with. So it's probably got pushed. But I know that Susan and Guilford were working on and they met. And so if Susan's done her bit, what is like why is it it's first of june why are we anticipating yeah Guilford has a million things on his plate right now and i you know that's okay. why you know he just has a lot on his plate and yeah trying to get contracts out and things like that okay yeah i i know that it's it's slipping um it's not intentional it's just that you know i mean swamped I down there I totally understand the priorities. We get so many emails about uh, speeding and potholes, and I totally get that. I just want to be clear that is is there anything that Susan can do to take you know to finish the thing and whatever she can do so that he has minimal work at his. Yeah, end? yeah, that's what that's one of the things we talked about today is what can I do to help? What can we? What can Town Hall do to help to fashion it into an RFI? It's, the content is there. It's just a matter of putting it into the format that we need to use for the RFI. And we have a sample RFI now that and should Susan, make it easier. Can Susan fill it out? And he yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll check with her. I'm not sure what kind of hours she has left. Sorry. I apologize. I'm getting too much. Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Shalini. Okay, were there any other questions or comments for Paul? All right. Well, thank you, Jennifer, for coming in and joining us. Okay, thank you for letting me be part of the panel. You can zap me out <laughs> to the audience. Thank you. See you.
Okay. So thank you again, Paul. And we're going to be moving on to just a few appointments and reappointments this evening. Um, Anna, uh, Anna and I are going to kind of tag team this. So we're thinking, I see you, uh, to go over if you would like Paul to go over the appointments first. And then I think uh, Anna has a monster to follow that with. And then we could do the same for reappointments. Does that make sense? Whatever makes sense for the committee. Okay. Uh, Anna, what, what were you thinking? Yeah, so I have separate um, motions for all of the uh, first time appointments. And then I checked with Athena and she said that unless there are objections, she doesn't see a problem with making a motion uh, that specifically references the memo and uh, approves all of them as written in the memo um, and with the expiration dates as stated in the memo. So I want to check in and make sure that there isn't opposition to that. If there is, I can do, I, I don't know how many there are, Paul, but it's at least 10, I think, um, reappointments and as separate motions. I just would like to, I was thinking about efficiency. Yeah in terms of the reappointment. So that's my proposed process and I have those motions all ready to go. Kelly, I did send them to Athena so that you don't have to type them all every time. Thank you, that is great. Helpful. All right. Okay, so I'll, I'll go through the um, appointments uh, by, by committee. So the first one is the Human Rights Commission. And and just to, I wanna give you a backup. This is a gargantuan work amount of work for uh, Angela. Because if you look at these, we, these this is a result of getting a lot of people into the same room on the same day at the same time. You know, it's usually three or four or five people doing the interviewing, uh, and then they then the, a series of the applicants because we have to get all the applicants available. And they're very short interviews; they're fifteen minute interviews, um, and we have a pretty standard format that we follow for every interview. And for each of these appointments, you might have. A difference, you know, you can have two times as many people who've applied. So when you think about how, you know, and I don't know the number for HRC, um, suppose it was like this might be an hour worth of interviewing plus cons consultation plus the setting up and then everybody has a change of time. Just so I just want to recognize Angela's work and pulling this together and she's oftentimes consulting with people if they don't get appointed what would you think of this position or that position Got a lot of folks come up and just say i just want to donate my time so first one hrc um we have two really good candidates and deborah Kaladny is is a um, i met her at some event at mill river and she quickly introduced herself she's a lawyer she's a rabbi she moved here fairly recently um from portland oregon was very involved in a lot of uh, progressive causes in portland and um has been on uh, working with police oversight boards, um, which is what she also wants to serve on at some point, um, has been a facilitator, um, labor negotiator with, with municipal unions, a lot of background, um, and really wants to work to help committees get to uh, a, a, a healthy dialogue and then a conclusion. So she seems like a very strong candidate for the Human Rights Commission. We're losing some very strong people off the HRC too. So that's why it's important to have strong people. Um, Jacinta Smith is a student at um, Amherst College. Um, she is, um, has been very passionate about human rights issues since high school. Um, we have, for many of our committees, we've had several candidates from Amherst College. There's a push among students, among faculty to get students to put their names forward. Um, we had, I think, three students from Amherst College who were interested for this committee in particular. So it's one that resonates with students a lot. Um, just into is clearly the best we could. We didn't feel like it was right to put more than one. We, we already have one Amherst College student on the HRC. We didn't want to put three, basically. So, um, so she will be a very strong uh, candidate, um, and is uh, is will be here for another two years. Um, and since the HRC is meeting remotely, you know she's going to be here through the summer, so it's not going to be an issue. But for them when she meets and, and she's one of the things we ask about HRC members is if they're willing to do sort of legwork um, for events that the HRC puts on. So that's Human Rights Commission. I have a quick question. Were sure. there two uh, replacements or were there, was there a vacancy? Um, there, 
there are there are people who are who are uh, coming off who don't want to be reappointed. Okay. Uh, were there were there two? So you filled their seats. We or may, I think we I think I think we have more we have more vacancies on HRC. Okay. okay. Um, like Philip is going to be coming off because he's moving, and somebody else, Cedric, I think, is coming off. Um, the second is the months of Memorial Building Trustees. Um, this is a three-member committee that um, helps to guide the uh, policies at the Munson Memorial Building. Uh, Jenny Arch is a relatively new resident to town, moved here during the, during the pandemic, is a librarian, a school librarian, has been involved in libraries a lot. While this isn't necessarily a library oversight position, there is the you know, branch of the Jones of the library in the building. And she's a neighbor and the charge for the um, Munson building is that it be they we we have to we prefer someone who is from South Amherst. So um, and she's a she's a person who frequents the building a lot with her kids and stuff like that. And a graduate of Hampshire College. Um, never failed to mention that. Um, for the Community Preservation Act Committee, uh, two very strong candidates. One is Becky Demling, um, who has been previously served on the Recreation Commission, has a longtime volunteer in the schools, um, very much um, interested in recreational thing and activities, especially maintaining our parks, not just building new ones, but making sure they get taken care of. Um, and uh, brings a perspective of a, of a parent uh, um, especially a parent of a special needs student. So um, she'll be a good addition. And then Bob Saul is someone, and Andy may know Bob, I don't know him, but until I met him and he's a interesting person. He lives on East Hadley Road, owns a farm, um, used to be on the finance committee and the audit committee some time ago. And I, I think um, Angela was trying to, re was in the recruitment mode. And so she's talking this up all the time and she has some connection to him. And, and he said, I haven't been involved in a long time, um, but he is a, um, a really into maple syrup and stuff like that. So, um, so he, but he's a really solid person and good addition to the CPA committee. And, and basically said, I have no, in, you know, I, I don't have any special interest. I'm just, you know, coming at this open-minded. So, um, so those are those two. CDBG. Um, the advisory committee, uh, Zoe Solis, um, she has been working in um, social service agencies for, for many years um, and has done contract management, has done program uh, evaluation. Uh, her, she has a real fondness for our public schools. Her kids really benefited from our public schools and she really felt it important for her to give back. And she brings multiple languages to, um, to the endeavor. Um, Council on Aging, um, three really interesting candidates. Mark Barrett, who you may you remember last time we talked about him, he was appointed to the Housing Authority. He's a resident of uh, on Chestnut Street. Um, he moved here relatively recently, he used to live in Belchertown, where he initiated the Rainbow Coffee Hour. He's doing the same thing uh, for um, our senior center. Um, has been actively volunteering. He's, you may have seen him if you were at the volunteer fair at the open house for the senior center. He's, he's really actively involved with the senior center and will be a real a strong uh, uh, member of the, of the Council on Aging. Sarah McComb is a person who, um, again, relocated to town after living in town for many, many years um, and has a real broad range of interests and skills and, um, and, one of her interests is really making sure that um, what, she, what I think we call younger, older adults, people in their 60s who might not consider themselves seniors are getting engaged and being plugged in and that we start to program more actively for that. And that's one of our senior center director's real missions is to um, make the senior center not feel it's just for older people. It is, but it's not just for older people. Um, so, and then uh, Don Ripley is a, um, again, a relatively new uh, resident to town. He has been, um, because he has um, children and grandchildren here. Um, and um, he was very impressive in his interview with the kinds of um, values that he felt was really important for the senior center to hold. Uh, he's been on the board of trustees of an assisted living uh, skilled nursing facility um, for um, 
for a very long time was actually president of the board, really had a sense of what a board should do and could do, um, the role of a president of a board or chair of a committee, um, and, um, and, and just had a real sort of um, a nuanced understanding of what older people needed at different stages of their lives. So uh, really interesting new person to be involved with the town. Uh, Water Supply Protection Committee, a um, lot of interest in this committee. It's a committee that um, doesn't meet very frequently, you know, two or three or four times a year, but it is, you know, that we have so much talent in this in this community. We had um, lots of people with really high level skill sets who were interested in serving because it's an important committee because it really, um, you know, looks at water supply issues. You know, they did a study on the um, solar impact on the water supply earlier this year. Um, uh, professor Guzman is, is a um, assistant professor of, at the university. Um, when he talked about the kind of research he did about the impact of groundwater on, and surface water on water supplies, and he's studying things in Massachusetts. He uh, his, takes his classes to Lake Warner and Hadley. Um, it's just like so relevant uh, to what this committee has to do in terms of looking at um, our the town's water resources. It's a very, very strong committee and staffed really well by um, Amy Rusecki and Beth Wilson, who's our environmental scientist at, at the DPW. So I think those are all the new appointments, yeah. Wow, that was something. Uh, thank you for that. And also um, please extend our thanks to Angela for all her hard work and not only helping with these appointments, but getting those who weren't appointed in spaces where they can be of service. Andy. Yeah, I just wanted, since Paul mentioned that uh, I knew and had worked with Bob Saul when, um, who's one of the two CPA um, designees, um, and that's absolutely correct on the, on the old finance committee uh, back in um, those days, uh, which was before I was on the select board, um, I was chair of that committee and, uh, and Bob was a member of the committee. And, um, he was uh, excellent, he asked. He was very analytical, very well informed, asked good questions, uh, was a real contributor and a real collaborative person. And um, the other one person who was nominated for that committee is uh, Becky Domling. And I actually worked with her also, um, but in a different capacity when I was on the select board, I was liaison to the LSSC commission and uh, she was a member of the LSSC commission at that time, which is how I first got to know Becky. And uh, she was also very interested and um, regular attendee very thoughtful, very well informed. Uh, so I just uh, leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Anna, you ready, Anna? I'm ready. We still have to do six of them, but it's not 27. Okay. Uh, I move for the town services and outreach committee to recommend to the town council, the town manager appointment of Zoe Solis, Solis, Solis excuse me, to the Community Development Block Grant Advisory Committee for a term to expire June 30th, 2025. No second. Thanks, Andy. All right, we'll call Shalini. Yes. Okay. Andy. Yes. Anna. Yes. I, and I'm a yes, so that is four with four with one absence. CBD, CD. CD, I can never do it. I will never get that acronym to flow off of my tongue. Okay. Uh, I move for the town services and outreach committee to recommend to the town council, the town manager appointment of Rebecca Demling and appointments of Rebecca Demling and Bob Saul to the community preservation act committee for terms to expire June 30th, 2026. Do I have a second? Second. Oh, and all right. We'll switch it around to Anna. Hi. Shalini. Yes. Andy. Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Okay, so that is a unanimous one. 
All right, next up, I move for the Town Services and Outreach Committee to recommend to the Town Council the Town Manager appointments of Mark Barrett, Sarah McComb, and Don Ripley to the Council on Aging for a term to expire June 30th, for terms to expire June 30th, 2026. Come on, John. Second. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Shalini. Yes. Andy. Yes. Anna. Yes. And I'm a yes. Okay. So that's four with one absence. Thank you. Uh, next up, I move for the Town Services and Outreach Committee to recommend to the Town Council the Town Manager appointment of uh, appointments of Deborah Kolodny and Jacinta Smith to the Human Rights Commission for terms to expire June 30th, 2026 and June 30th, 2025, respectively. Second. Thanks, Mika. And then we'll call Ash Shalini. Yes. Andy. Yes. Ah. Aye. And I'm a yes as well. Or again. Two more. Aye. I move for the Town Services and Outreach Committee to recommend to the Town Council the Town Manager appointment of Jenny Arch to the Munson Memorial Building Trustees for a term to expire June 30th, 2025. Second. Yay, thank you, Sean. All right, call it. Andy. Yes. Shalini. Yes. Anna. Aye. And I am an I, so four with one absence. And last but not least, I move for the Town Services and Outreach C Committee to recommend to the Town Council the Town Manager appointment of Christian Guzman to the Water Supply Protection Committee for a term to expire June 30th, 2026. Second, Shalini. Thank you, Shalini. And we'll call it Andy. Yes. Shalini. Yes. Aye. Aye. And I am an aye for, again, one absent. Thank That's you. all I got until we get to reappointments. So I'm right. back to you. Paul, can we come back to you for reappointments, please? Sure. So there are 20 names here for your reappointments, and they're all pretty standard. I will highlight three things for you. Um, one, the Affordable Housing Trust, you'll notice that there are two year appointments, and that's in the bylaw. So trust members only get two year appointments, everybody else is three year appointments. The second is the Registrar of Voters. Um, under the state law, um, you need equal represent, representation from the Democrat, Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Uh, Jamie Wagner represents the Republican Party. And um, so we're grateful that she has uh, re-upped to serve on, in that capacity. And then the um, Water Supply Protection Committee, which we just talked about, Jack Jemsek has been on and the chair um, of the committee felt very strongly that he should be reappointed because of he's the only hydrogeologist that's on the committee and brought a skill set that they didn't that nobody else replicated. Um, so, other, other, everybody else is pretty much was it you know they're all just renewals. Thank you. The renewals of commitment and dedication and not just renewals expertise. exactly there. There's well, so much. All right, you ready? Yeah. There are so many. <laughs> yes. All right. I move for the Town Services and Outreach Committee to recommend to the Town Council the approval of all committee reappointments and their term expiration dates as specified by the Town Manager in the Appointments Memo dash reappointments dated May 30th, 2023. I can. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. All right. Roll call. Andy. Yes. Anna. Aye. Shall. Yes. And I am an aye. Thank you. And, okay. Or with. So, and oh, if I, I can add one, so you will get one more memo, like this reappointment memo. This is the first group. There'll be a, there's another group coming uh, once we get everything lined up for that. So you'll have another memo similar to this with, with a lot of other committees. Okay. So if they're not on this committee, it doesn't mean they're not getting reappointed. It's just. So. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to that. All right. Healthy fills and reappointments, so that's great. Uh, now we are going to move on again to Paul, who is going to give us an update. I think many of us are aware we've been receiving many emails about the Cushman School Crossing. 
Uh, so Paul is going to give us an update about where where we are, and what goes on there. Yeah, Thank so you. if if you're familiar with the Cushman School on Henry Street in North Amherst, um, what happens now is parents are parking on both sides of the street and then they w walk across the street and it's a high, uh, um, there's a lot of cars that go by there and some at, at a higher rate of speed. I think, and also we all know that when you're walking and you're on the side of the road, if a car goes by, even at within the speed limit, it feels like it's going fast. So police um, have, they were up there for a week, uh, did some uh, traffic, um, monitoring and identified speeds and the types of vehicles that were traveling. They did it at the beginning of the day between eight and 10, at the end of the day between three and five. Uh, that information has been shared with the neighbors as well. Um, so there's a, a, a group of parents and guardians who have their children in the school plus administrators at the school who are interested in you know, trying to do something uh, to keep the children and the parents guardians safe. Right now, people park on one side of the street and then have to walk across. And sometimes cars and trucks can be moving pretty swiftly. So they had suggested a number of things. And, um, you know, and we had a little bit of um, um, communication issues within our departments between police and DPW. Police were saying, looking at suggestions and saying that makes sense to us. It goes to the town engineer and he says that's not allowed um, under the uniform manual of traffic control devices. This is this uniform manual is something that all states use. It's you're supposed you're not supposed to put a traffic control device or whatever or, or the signage is supposed to look similar from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. It's so that when you travel from Amherst to Hadley, your expectations as a driver shouldn't have to shift. Like suddenly you you know they have stop signs everywhere or they don't. Like you know you could imagine imagine if Hadley said we want to put a stop sign at every intersection on Route Nine. Um, they would, you know, so it's it's supposed to control what 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 is allowed, uh, what are the warrants, what they call to allow for traffic control devices. So they had a number of different ideas. One making it a one way street, some uh, putting additional signage up, um, and so we met today uh, with our staff only, with police and, and DPW, um, and have a number of um, uh, suggestions. Um, and concerns and some different sort of levels of um, of addressing the issue, and some of it might be, you know, I think the sort of common thing was, can we have, can we help it so people don't cross the street? Period. Like that's that's the first. That's where the the the, um, the issue comes up is when people are trying to cross the street. Can we put the parking adjacent to the school so you don't have to cross the street ever? So that's one of the you know, ways of looking at this. Um, but so our next step is to um, have this group that met today from police and DPW to meet with the um, school administrator and the neighbors. Uh, Dr. Anderson's been really involved and very coherent in how they've organized material. So it's been really helpful and get that on the calendar. Uh, so, and it might be something that comes back to the town council at some point, but we'll talk about different options that we can do. Um, you know, like one that we, we're trying to figure out if we're allowed to put school zone lights because it's not truly a school, it's a daycare thing. And so there's, but there's been some changes to the law recently. So that we're, they're looking into what can actually be done there. And what, and what, what will make a difference. Thank you. Thank you for um, taking up this issue so quickly and bringing a, um, letting us know about your meeting acting so quickly. Uh -huh. uh, Anna. Well, thank you. This is really helpful, I think. And it's it's helpful in a broader context too, because I think we get a lot of requests for traffic calming. And um, it's, it's helpful to know that there's a standard that is applied um, and we can't necessarily just ask for anything that we think would be helpful, even though we, we know it would be helpful. Um, and I'm curious in your opinion, in, in your understanding, where would changes from like where do where would advocacy for changes to that happen? So, for example, where would where would we advocate to have preschools or daycare centers be included? I guess preschools might be, but daycare centers be included in a, an opportunity to have a, a school. I recognize the myriad of ways that, that could go terribly wrong, but yeah. where's the advocacy on that? So, where I mean, if it's if it's a state law, it's a state law, right? Um, and so, if you're in a school, and I, we just didn't know have the information at this meeting whether 
daycare centers that were included in that or not. You know, yeah, so we have to, that's the first piece of information. So it may they may be included, and that's fine because that makes you allow allow you to drop the speed limit from to down to twenty miles per hour um, during 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 school certain periods of time, which you see that during. Um, you know, during, during this, you know, at, at the, our three elementary schools in high school. The other thing though, is that we also think about, okay, if it goes here, what, what other schools in this same type of thing might want them to be applied? And so there's a, you know, half a dozen other schools of this ilk that we could may, may say, hey, we want this too. And we'd have to decide, if, is it a standard yes to everybody? Is it going to be a case by case situation? So just want to take make sure that the council understands the full context of what the decision is when it comes to you. And do you know where we can find that manual to read it? Yeah, I can send it. Oh, the manual? Sure, I can send you. Yeah, a be, I mean, I think it'd be helpful for us to know so, as we get request. The you two, you said it, There's okay. two different things. There's okay. a state law. There's state law that regulates speeding and what can be called a school zone. And then there's uh, and I can send you links to both of these. And then there's the uniform manual of traffic control devices, Platform. which is the Bible that the town engineer uses. And I'd you love know, to both of it, so. sure. Yeah, I think it's online. Great. I can. I think I caught what you said, but if you could send it out, that would be really yep. helpful. Sure. Does um, everybody want it? Yes. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think that really would be often when we get questions from folks about traffic calming. I don't even know where to start, and so it's really it would be helpful to be able to at least have an understanding of what's possible under current law and where we might want to advocate with our legislators if that feels like something that's important enough for us to want to do. Yeah, so the uniform manual is something that engineers do nationwide. It's not a state thing Got or something it. like that, you know. We can advocate there too, but yeah, I get you. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Andy. Yeah, uh, living just a couple hundred yards from that intersection, I know it well. And uh, I've actually, this is not the first time this issue has arisen in my memory. Um, and I remember that there was a big push on to install uh, stop signs uh, in all directions at that intersection with Pine Street and Henry Street with the thought that that was going to uh, reduce speeds because people would have to be nearing a stop, a stop sign to stop anyway. Um, and, you know, that didn't happen then and now it's helpful to have that information as to why it didn't happen at the time that it came up previously. Um, it is um, it is a problem, and I think that the uh, biggest difficulty is exactly what Paul said, and that is that um, you've got a large number of parents dropping off kids because it's a older um, was originally an elementary school, you know, like a three-room schoolhouse that belonged to the town, and I think originally was uh, rented to uh, the um, daycare center, the preschool, and uh, I, not, I think that we did some sale or um, of the I think it's a 99-year lease or something like that. Yeah, something like that, but in any event, um, the it's a fairly large building and so that there's a lot of kids that get dropped off there and picked up there which makes it different from a lot of other locations and um the uh um point that paul made about um the big problem is is that the cars having to park on the other side of the street so i uh hope that um, as uh, DPW looks at it, they think about suggestions that they might make to the school itself about whether they can move the employee parking to some other location so that the, all those parking places that are uh, sort of uh, just beyond the school towards Pine Street um, and uh, in front of the playground can be used as uh, this parking for people who are dropping off and picking up kids that then parents wouldn't have to walk across the street with their kids. So, um, you know, I, I, I hope that DPW is thinking creatively about what they might suggest to the school to um, participate 
in the solution. That's yeah, I, I think I think there's some low cost solution, like if they wanted to hire crossing guards to help people cross, you know, that would be one thing that could just be done now. Um, more expensive solutions would be to create additional parking adjacent to the school. Um, sometimes the parking for employees also includes specialists there, and it depends on the student population who, if they have spe you know, audiologists or, uh, who show up and they need to park as well. Um, and where they tend to park, if they tend to park adjacent to the school or across the street from the school. Um, we start to talk a little bit about if it were one way, what would the, then there's, a, there's always some ancillary impacts. So if all those cars coming up Henry Street turn, had to turn left onto Pine Street and then turn right onto that East Leverett Road or, or hypotenuse, it'll cut through there somehow. Um, what would that, how could trucks navigate that? It's already, Pine Street's already a narrow road. It, so there's just a lot of things to take into consideration. If that's something the council wanted to explore, um, I think that's something would, would be a much bigger um, study that would have to be done. Yeah, and I guess my only comment about what you just said is that um, I think that there's a difference between somebody who's um, walking across the street with the preschooler and all the things you have to bring with you to school uh -huh. um, and uh, an adult who's show coming because they're providing special services, but uh, um, they're not... Um, being responsible for a very young child at the same time. Right. So uh, moving the parking places, I, I think it is something that um, ought to be considered even, I think there's no prohibition in itself for parking on the other side of the street. So right. that could be a, a solution. Yeah, I think that, that we all came to the conclusion that preventing little kids from having to cross the street, because you know they can run away, you know, you can, you lose grip or whatever you haven't closed the door yet um is best is you know that's the best solution not not have to say if they don't have to cross the street that's the best solution yes great were there any other questions or comments okay well thank you again paul okay. mm -hmm and for our residents for writing it. Uh, so we're now we're going to move into, I'm not sure if this is three, four, or five, or the fifth rather, review for our um, proposed street light policy. So we have this on our agenda this evening in great part because uh, as of our last discussion, there were clearly some questions. Um, Andy was celebrating a birthday and wasn't able to be with us. And so this is an opportunity for any of us who have further questions or concerns um, that we would like to extend to Anna and then uh, Mandy and also really in main part because Shalini had a um, suggestion proposal that she wanted to uh, bring forward and talk with us about today. So again, the goal would be here that if there are questions, thoughts, concerns as we would get them out today, um, relay them to the sponsors, and then this item will be back on our agenda for our next meeting on the 15th with the goal of taking action then. So that would be the 15th of June. Um, Dorothy, as I said before, she's not with us, but she did state that any and all her, her concerns and questions about the policy that she relayed during the last meeting. Nika, could you bring um, Mandy Joe in from the audience? I'm oh, sorry. Mandy is in the audience. Would oh, yes, know? yes. I'm sorry. I didn't even say, excuse me. I, okay, she was in before. All right. Welcome, Mandy. Welcome. Thank you for being with us. Okay. So, with that, Shalini, I'm going to hand the floor over to you. Okay, so the proposal that Nika mentioned is a larger thing, which I can talk about later, but more specifically about the lighting bylaw, I just wanted to highlight some of the questions and concerns I had that I think um, what I'm hoping is that if you can answer those 
you know, we can move forward with the goal of them being able to vote on it. So the first question is about um, tax recommendations, the Trans the Transportation Advisory Committee. They had emailed us with two specific recommendations. One was to add um, in your bio in the policy add crosswalks and bus stops as locations where street lights will be provided. And I think that's on page one of the policy. And I see that you have added regional transit bus stops, um, but it does not include local bus stops and crosswalks have not been included. And so is there a reason for excluding those? And, they, she, and Tracy also sent us report, uh, um, research showing why it's important to have lighting at these intersections. So is there a reason why the policy does not include um, these street lights there at crosswalks and bus stops? Do you want me to say the second one also? Or should I wait for a response? Honor, Amanda, would you like to respond? Um, you can go ahead with the second question, okay. unless Mandy, unless Mandy has. Okay. Um, and then the other recommendation that they had was to rephrase the section. Um, this is something we all received, but I just want to make sure that we are acknowledging that we received tax uh, recommendations. And then I also wanted to hear from the sponsor's point of view how you're resolving either making the changes according to their recommendations or you have a reason for not doing so and what is that reason so the other recommendation was rephrase the section saying that street lights will not be provided by the town um, for pedestrians in residential neighborhoods and to remove the phrase because such lighting could be requested virtually everywhere in the town um, it's part of the same sentence. And I think this request was made to, because the way it is right now, even though it was the original language in 2001, uh, Town of Amherst streetlights policy, but it seems like unfriendly to pedestrians and uh, other vulnerable road users. And this was uh, the reasoning that Tracy uh, Zafian sent that it seems unfriendly and since we're trying to move towards a, a walkable sustainable town that maybe rephrasing this part and to just get rid of that part um which says that yeah anyway you got we all got that email so those were the two questions pertaining how we are responding to tax recommendations Do you want me to try and answer them on or would you like to? Um, if you want to start, that'd be great. And then I can fill in if you like. Yeah, I, I will start. So crosswalks, um, they were not added. Uh, going back, we went back to trying not to do anything at all with placement. Because when we talked about changing anything related to where street lights go, um, there, it became immensely more difficult to, to make those decisions because the outreach needed the discussion with the DPW, with all of the other boards and committees, and frankly, that everyone has different opinions as to where streetlights should be. So our tact when we went to this sort of plan when we removed all of the proposals related to location, the, the attempt was to keep the location standards as similar to where they are now as possible. Um, you'll notice that I even left in the ends of cul-de-sacs, which I think is absolutely ridiculous personally, <laughs> um, because you can do that with um, with reflectors. You don't need a light at the end of cul-de-sacs. Um, you can make it safe with just reflectors. But um, so so starting with that premise, trying to minimize the amount of changes or any changes to where streetlights will be provided because of the necessary public outreach and conversation that needs to go along with any of those changes. Um, crosswalks, uh, first of all, this policy already provides all intersections. Nearly all crosswalks are at intersections. 
Um, and so their most crosswalks are already lit uh, because they're located at intersections, which under this policy, lighting is provided at intersections. The crosswalks that are not at intersections, um, lighting, this type of street lighting, number one, may not be the most appropriate. We don't know. Um, there may not be a method of adding a street light at a mid-block crosswalk because there might not be a power pole there, which is how we tend to add the street lights right now. Um, and so mid-block crosswalks, we thought um, needed a different type of consideration than being just put into this policy. So that's why we didn't add crosswalks. We thought most crosswalks were already covered by the intersection coverage. Um, and the other ones needed a different discussion um, as to what would be more appropriate there. Would mid-block crosswalks benefit from a light overhead more or less than they might benefit from a flashing beacon like we have at some intersections that you press when you're actually a pedestrian there and wanting to cross that starts flashing? Just needed a different conversation, we believed. Um, bus stops. The word bus stop is very vague in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Does it include, if we were just to say at bus stops, does it include just the PVTA? Does it include the PVTA plus the buses that, the shuttles that run from um, the new apartment complex on Route 9 to UMass? Does it include school bus stops? Does it include summer shuttle bus stops? Does it include Peter Pan bus stops? Does it include, you, you get where I'm going. And so, the thought in putting regional transit bus stops was to ensure that the bus stops we're talking about are those PVTA buses. Those are the bus stops we're talking about, not the summer camp shuttle buses that might stop somewhere in town three months a year. Um, not, not the shuttle buses that run from apartment complexes or Applewood into town and where they drop off and pick up. Um, so that's why we picked regional transit bus stops. Um, and the last one was the, the language. And I, I would just say to the language in that paragraph, removal of for pedestrians in residential neighborhoods, unless at least one of the above criteria is met, um, or um, because, and, and then the phrase, because such lighting could be requested virtually everywhere in town. Well, frankly, such lighting could be requested virtually everywhere in town if it doesn't meet one of these guidelines and is, quote, for pedestrians. Um, and so from my personal point of view, Anna might have a different one that would actually potentially cause more problems if you're eliminating streetlights will not be provided by provided for pedestrians in residential neighborhoods. Unless one of these is because any pedestrian, no matter how how little is walked in a neighborhood could in theory request a light. And so if you don't require pedestrian light requests to fit one of these criteria, you've now just opened up the entire placement conversation again, which is what we were trying not to do. That That's my opinion. Anna might have a different reason for um, not having proposed to take those those phrases out. Yeah, no, I, I think that for me, it, it opens up um, a big window for inequity, right? So again, like if we think about squeaky wheels um, and um, in, in this instance, squeaky wheel, meaning folks who know how to advocate for themselves, right? It's not a bad thing to be a squeaky wheel. It's that people know how to, um, how the, the system works and how to advocate and all of that. And so um, I think that we, we want to make sure that we're being really consistent in how we, um, how we are, are affording opportunity. And I also think that it does, yeah, if we're not applying a, a really solid metric, um, we're also not giving an opportunity for folks who might also live in that area to um, have a say in what goes in and what doesn't, right? So if my neighbor really was was able to fight hard and wants, or just asks for a street light and gets it, but I didn't want one, what's my recourse? And so it gets into this additional layer um, that didn't really feel equitable or, or, or fair on a baseline level. I think what um, they're trying to say is that we already, the policy is already saying that this is where it's going to be provided. So this is the criteria. So just to change the language a little bit to like, you don't need to say like, oh, 
like we're already saying this is a criteria that is going to determine where the lights go so i don't think we need to sit and if you're going to come to us for any other reason we're not going to listen to you i don't think we need to say that is i think the point that's being made if you can just adjust the language to and or maybe just at least remove that line because it's obvious that that's the criteria well for clarity i have a question so I get a shout out, but you're like, you're reading that with tone. And so with the, now that the, the, the actual sentence has gone out of my head, but it's just saying that, so is a sentence basically saying that you need to meet these, a, a light, a request for a street light would need to meet this criteria. Correct. Um, well, I, I can address some of that. So, so the paragraph reads, I'll, I'm going to read the whole paragraph because it's all in context. So there's a list of places that start with the streetlights will generally be provided by the town as follows. And then there's a bullet pointed list. Mm -hmm. Then there's a paragraph and that paragraph reads, assuming the changes are made from select board to town council, um, the town council shall interpret the application of the above criteria to specific streetlights and the town will provide streetlights at other locations deemed appropriate by the town council. However, streetlights will not be provided by the town as security lighting for private property or for pedestrians in residential neighborhoods unless at least one of the above criteria is met or the town council otherwise deems the situation to require a streetlight because such lighting could be requested virtually everywhere in town. So I, I think my question with that is if we just took out the because such lighting could be requested virtually would that um, I think it, it's I don't know we didn't put it in there but um, if that is a, a solution I'm I mean I, I personally am fine with that I, I'm not sure what I think it was trying to contextualize the request because I think people didn't really understand why um, why that was in there. In, in past years. I think Andy has a sound up. I just want to hear what he has to say and then I can. Andy, please go ahead. I think you're muted. Okay, now I'm not muted. Um, now I'm struggling a little bit with the criteria question too, because I have had uh, conversations with some people in certain neighborhoods who were making a good case. And um, I would describe it as follows, that if there's a residential street and there's a higher than normal vehicular and pedestrian traffic level and there are no sidewalks, that that combination of circumstances creates a special criteria. And I guess that I'm not, what I was trying to figure out is, does our process allow for consideration of those kinds of factors or should we actually be at least um, saying that if there is a combination of circumstances and no sidewalks, um uh, or uh, no sidewalks and exceptionally high vehicular and pedestrian traffic mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that that it should be considered doesn't mean it has to be done but uh so that was that was my question that's consistent with this and then i have one other item that's unrelated so i'll hold it for later Thank you, Andy. Shana, did you have another question? Um, uh, yeah. Oh, uh, Mandy, you, when you said intersections includes cross, wait, wait, sorry, not the intersections. Um, I've lost my page. Uh, I think it was around the, the bus stops. Do they include the local buses? So I don't mean like the camps and all of that, but the language that's used right now, the regional, what is it? Oh, I've lost all the pages. Um, where is it? 
it is the regional transit bus stop. Does that include the bus stops that people are taking their buses uh, in our neighborhoods and local oh, yeah. buses? If it's a PVTA, what are local buses? I'm sorry, yeah. I thought all of our buses were PVTA, so I'm a little stuck on what local bus. I think PVTA, yeah. The, so that the is PVTA. a regional bus stop. Yeah, the PVTA is a regional transit authority. So okay. every stop that the PVTA does is a regional bus stop. Okay, okay, okay. So that is covered. And then I I don't know if the, I mean, I'm just responding to or speaking on behalf since Tracy is not here. And since TAC does have the expertise in this area and the research, so I just want to make sure that we are acknowledging and addressing the questions. So as long as it is covering what they think they're advising us is safe. Uh, and if it covers that, then I'm good with that. And then uh, in terms of the language, again, um, um, I think just at least removing, in the least removing that last line, which I don't think is adding anything, but it does sound a little in your face, kind of. Uh, and since it has come from TAC, which is a committee that we are inviting feedback from, so I think it's, uh, if it's not adding anything really substantial, I think it's, uh, it's a good idea to just remove that line. And I didn't know if anyone answered Andy's question about. Um, That's about what I raised my hand for, if I could. Yeah. Mandy and Anna, please go ahead. Um, I, I think, Andy, there are two phrases within that paragraph that, that give the council the flexibility necessary. The first one is, um, the town will provide streetlights at other locations deemed appropriate by the town council. So the town council interprets the application of the criteria, and then the town provides streetlights at other locations deemed appropriate by the council. And then the other phrase, that's the first sentence. And the second sentence that starts, however, streetlights will not be provided for security lighting or pedestrians in residential neighborhoods unless at least one of the above criteria is met or the town council otherwise deems the situation to require a street light. And then there's the phrase, because such lighting could be requested virtually everywhere in town. So I think some of the situations you talk about deem interpretation, what is heavy pedestrian traffic? What is um, road conditions deemed potentially hazardous areas with high accident? You know, there, there's a little bit of interpretation in there and it, it provides that additional ability for the town council to say this is a spot where maybe we need more lighting than is typically provided because um, there are thousands of UMass students walking along the street every day, you know, for example, um, and there aren't sidewalks or the, the sidewalks need lit or, or whatchamacallit because of that. Um, I, I would just say, I think the phrase, I mean, I'll go with the TSO obviously needs to make its choice, but the phrase, because such lighting could be requested virtually everywhere in town, I think does add something personally. I think it does clarify that, you know, um, we have to make decisions because we're not going to light every area of town and provide a street light where everyone wants to have one because they walk their dog at night on a barely lit street, but don't want to carry a flashlight. Um, you know, we're not going to provide that. And I, I think the because such lighting could be requested does provide it, but it's clearly up to TSO to make that decision if there's a motion. Thank you, Mandy. Anna? I'm wondering, Paul, if you have any insights into, I, I mean, I, I understand what Mandy is saying, and I'm curious, Paul, if you have any insights into what the origins of that particular line are um, that you might share, if it's something that DPW felt needed to go in there, if it's something that, that whoever initially wrote this, I'm assuming town meeting somehow, some way, um, if there's any other understanding that we might gain from, from the background of this that you know of. I could read your lips. You don't know, but I, I, I did. Yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't have any in, insights into that. I mean, we'd have to, I could ask Guilford for sure. Right. Okay. So maybe what it sounds like is we should also, um, if, as Mandy and I discussed the, the merits of keeping or taking that away, 
Um, we can also talk to Guilford to ask his opinion on it and as the people who are who would be installing these as well, uh, his opinion on that specific sentence. Um, we've already, we have spoken to him about the policy, of course, but um, that didn't come up in any of our conversations with him before, but we can ask him very specifically about it. Yeah, and if possible, like if it has to be included, maybe tweaking it in a way that it does not. Do you want me to just read? I think it's very compelling what Tracy wrote. Should I just read it quickly? Or is that? Okay, so she said that um, the language has a tone that is unfriendly to pedestrians and other vulnerable road users and can be viewed as a as contradicting both town transportation and sustainability goals of encouraging more residents to walk and bike and take transit and use their cars less and town goals about creating a more age friendly community. And the responses to the recent age friendly community assessment and needs survey shows that many current and future seniors are concerned about transportation safety and walking safety including how dark some streets sidewalks and neighborhoods are at night in march 2023 tac passed a motion recommended that the language be removed so. thank you andy i was just going to say that if you want history i think we'd have to figure out when the original policy was implemented, I think it was by the select board at the time. And if we can identify any uh, current residents of the town who are on that select board, then we'll have a basis for uh, finding out if there's any history that's available for it. it. It shows that it was adopted December 3rd, 2001. And I guess we have to go back and look at who was on the select board at that time, which I don't have the excuse me bandwidth to do right this second. Um, but uh, Brian Harvey might be somebody who was on the select board at that time. I'd have a recollection. Thank you. Um, I'll add my two cents as somebody who's a, been a walker forever. Um, I am someone who has carried a, a flashlight in the most lit up area of town. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, um, I appreciate everything that we can do to move towards being sustainable and having more efficient lights, but also love being able to, um, walk around. I know that we have, we're in a car culture here and um, in many places, not just here, any space usually where there is no sidewalk or um, bike path is kind of a at your own risk if you're walking on it, so to speak. And, um, you know, I think um, last would be just, you know, but I think for many of us, it's just kind of moving into a new move into that walkability, you're also moving into just normalizing walking and biking as not just for leisure or exercise, but just someone's preferred or maybe um, only means of transportation, especially within um, within town center where you're just, you know, walking to get errands. I, I nine times out of 10 wouldn't think about, I don't drive anyway, but if I did, and when I do, which will be this summer, I would not think about driving to CVS, you know, unless it was like really bad weather, I wasn't um, well. So uh, that's just my two cents of consideration. And before we move to you again, Shalini, I just wanted to check in with Anna and Mandy that this, is, this item is on the agenda again for the 15th. Do you think that you all would be ready with either any adjustments that you may or may not consider in um, within that time? And would it be appropriate since we we all have the proposal and we've gone over it and we've read it a few times that if there are any other questions that anyone has uh, for Mandy and Anna that they would be sent in the interim? Mm -hmm. um, I'll speak for myself. I know that I have uh, a couple chunks of time. So as long as Mandy and I can coordinate a time to get together, um, we can uh, get some answers to these questions, hopefully all of them, and be ready for the 15th. Okay. And Andy, I'm going to just go ahead. Yeah, I had one other item. And that is under the page that's called Implementation of Appendix A. I think that we're going a little bit too far in 
picking on our town manager when we say that town manager lets us know that he's a problem with six month deadline that it has to go back to the council i think the last portion of number two is really unnecessary and uh, i think that we have to and should trust the good faith of um, our town manager to um, it, it either make the deadline or have good reason to extend it and to notify us that he's having to extend it but to take it to the council I think is uh, an unnecessary piece so I was just going to add that May, may I? Oh, please go right ahead. So, so that was, um, that's not language at all for the policy itself. It was left over that I didn't delete um, when we moved to this Appendix A um, that had been in the original policy about implementation standards that was written into the policy. I left it in because I thought maybe TSO might um, want to suggest as part of the adoption of the policy or if if CSO recommends adoption of these changes that part of that motion might include some sort of implementation timeline um and this was the original language proposed for implementation timelines but I, so I thought it might be helpful as we get to potentially recommending the policy itself um for TSO to think about how the policy gets adopted once implemented because if there's potentially not something listed similar to what's in um one and two of that implementation in theory everything would be out of compliance immediately and i'm not sure that's what the council is going for but i didn't think instead of putting it in the policy itself it could be part of the motion to the council so that's why I left the language there, but it's up for discussion. Thank you. Sean, I see you there. I just I just wanted to, I forgot to ask one question that was about the bus stops. Are the or is lighting at the bus stops even a something that is in control of the town? It is? Okay. All right. It's in the public way. And so it's I don't know. Okay. I don't know why for some reason I thought it was. PBTA to do that. Okay, that answers that. And I and Mandy, did you still have your hand up, or if not, we'll go on to Shelley. So yeah, the second issue is around dimming, and uh, within that, um, I think that's still problematic. It's on page six. If possible and not cost prohibitive, streetscape lighting shall be dimmed to no more than seventy percent of normal illuminated levels. Um, by 11 p.m. or and so that paragraph and the reason why that's still problematic um, based on what I've heard from Tracy again from and uh, just personally is that uh, we have a number of buses that are running late and last time we discussed it and we thought 11 was the latest but uh, Tracy actually sent the schedule to us and the latest one is at 1 20 a.m. And then the other issue around that is walking back and forth from downtown. So we're talking about downtown being, you know, keeping the lights, but people have to walk from downtown to their residential areas. So dimming the light as they're walking back at night is a problem. Uh, we talked about business. I don't know if you all had a chance to speak with what was the impact on businesses and the recommendation was to speak with uh, either the businesses directly or through bid get some feedback from the business improvement district or chambers or some way of finding out from businesses uh, how this might impact them as well as to the workers who might be taking buses at night and so how that might affect so is that something we need and we also heard that it's caught it's it's probably not available or it's really costly so is that something we need to include at this point or rather we can wait for the technology to be better and by then we could have done a better long a bigger survey and figured out um how that would work effectively uh, and and uh, Mandy, i by no means answering for you but i did just want to point out shauna we did pull up the actual bus schedule last time 
and how late the buses ran that they were after one um, oh. the sponsors had put in there and, and added that the 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 dimming wouldn't occur until it was like I think please correct me if I'm wrong it was like 3 a.m it ended up being around that time if I'm not maybe I'm mistaken but I know we actually pulled up the the schedule and pulled up the last buses okay I had it wrong then okay so, so Go ahead, Ben. I just want to say the dimming would be within one hour of the end of closing time for for the within the municipal parking district, which is the downtown area, or within a village center area, um, within one hour of the closing time of the last bar or live music venue. And so many of the closing times are one or two in the morning. And so in those areas, the dimming would have to happen by 3 a.m., which would be plenty of time for people to get out get on a bus um potentially walk home depending on how you define a village center um everywhere else it would be 11 p.m um yeah and everywhere else it would be 11 p.m in town just to correct that um bus schedules i i, I don't have it handy well, I mean, it's like South Amherst Village Centers don't have a bar. I, I mean, they have a bar. I don't know what the closing is, maybe 12. I don't know. So just saying that the last bar may not be the ideal without knowing what, I mean, the whole thing just seems pretty problematic to me without really knowing what the exact, we're like hypothesizing. I think the bars close at 12. Maybe they'll close at one. Maybe they close at two. So it should be fine. We're all like speculating here. It feels like it should be fine till three uh, without really well, knowing what the numbers are. Yep. So the, the bar in South Amherst is open until 1 a.m. Um, as, as are some of the ones downtown as well. I don't know that from personal experience. I feel like I should clarify. <laughs> so I, I would want to say one other thing, which is 70% is actually still fairly high. Um, so so yeah if it if it's the equivalent let's see if i can do something in town in it, that people a hundred watt light bulb it's changing a 100 watt light bulb to a 75 or 70 per, 70 watt light bulb not not a 50 or a 40 watt light bulb um it's it's that sort of dimming that sort of level of change depending on where you start but if you imagine a 100 watt old old time light bulb <laughs> putting in a 70 watt instead. I know there's not really 70 watts. There were 75 and 60 and 40, but it doesn't really work. Um, um, but um, that that's the difference. So, you know, I, uh, what we have heard or what I have heard when talking to people is that most people don't even notice that difference at all. Um, you know, and so the language could be revisited if it happens and if it becomes a problem, I would say, because the dimming is programmable if you've got the dimming. Um, but if you take the dimming out completely from the policy, you might never have the dimming capability. Until you, unless you brought it in at the time when it came, and then there would have be, be a proper process of talking with the businesses, with the public, with the residents who are, because this does say that it will reduce it in residence at 11 p.m. And then there are residents who are walking to their own neighborhoods. So even though in downtown it may be up till three, but then as you're walking towards your neighborhood, it's going to be dark. So I, I guess what I was trying to say is if there's no dimming provided in the policy at all, mm -hmm. the luminaires, the luminaires and the lights will not be bought with dimming, dimming capabilities mm -hmm. at all. And if they're not bought, you have 20 years before you get dimming capabilities again, potentially, unless you go out and buy again. Um, and so the policy is trying to look forward to make sure that the proper the the possibility is kept that there will be dimming if it's not cost prohibitive 
Because and we're then, not swapping out lights until they go out, right? Until right. they dim. And so if we swap them out with lights that do not have the capacity to dim, we're looking at another 10 years or, or more if we get better lights, which we're hoping to do. So, um, yeah. Like swapping in 10 years anyways, like we're not swapping in the next six months or so. We'd be swapping within the next eight or nine years when the relamping occurs. Right. So we and have if it's not buy. cost prohibitive, then we would buy dimmings. But if we don't put the requirement to buy dimmings in, if not cost prohibitive, then, then we probably won't have dimming. And then it will be another 20 years till you get dimming capabilities. And all of that would require a town council or town councilors who would want to write that question into the, or write that edit into this policy. And uh, Mandy and I are here now. We do not know if we will be here in 10 years or if we will be, you know, and so I, I think that that's, that's why we're putting it in now. No, I hear what you're saying, but I totally agree with you with the reasoning that it's good to have it so that when we buy it, it will be there. But my concern is without doing the appropriate, this is where I feel it does need a little more involved feedback for the people who are actually walking and who are workers or residents who are walking and relying on street like how is it affecting them and that and so I, is this something we could in, like we could include after because that was the proposal that i was going to introduce uh is and in talking with tracy and that and that maybe this needs to be a separate i don't know if it needs to be a separate agenda item or not but the idea would be to really look systematically at road safety from the residents point of view and the business's point of view and what uh, make them feel safe to go out and walk and bike and maybe even including uh, ECAC in this as a townwide survey that really looks at what are the neighborhoods, what are the challenges that people are encountering. And then part of that could include questions around um, this dimming and so forth. But I didn't want this particular um, policy to be delayed and be tied to that one so that which is why I was thinking like if we can just separate that this dimming part out or if you're really really wanting it in Tracy has sent uh, some language that might um, might uh, ensure or make sure the safety is um, is forefront so I can read that language or send it to you all. But I think that's something that needs to be discussed by Tia. So what is the language we want? Okay, so so Shalini, with your request for today, you were going to have an action, an action to follow up what you with um what your suggestions were. I just have before that you do that or we move on or you submit your um questions or what Tracy had said to you on and Mandy. Um, I did just have one last question. Forgive me if it is in this policy already, but was there a time of lights were dimming an hour after the latest business closes? Um, was, was there, what time are they coming back on? Or would they just be off until, until sunrise, whenever that is? Like what about winter months when it's dark until like- They would be dimmed until dawn. And then at dawn, they would go off like all street lights would. The street lights could be turned on no earlier than dusk and off no later than dawn. Oh and so God. they would be dimmed from the time they start the dimming until they're turned until off. The until okay, thank you. That should be obvious, but I was just wondering about those like long winter nights. Okay. Um, Shalami, did you yeah. have something else? Yeah. Well, I guess I just wanted to hear from other people how they feel about the dimming and do we want that to be part of this or do we want to separate that out and do the townwide survey or a larger public forum and then decide what the language is going to be and incorporate that separately. So I'm happy to go where the committee is. I just and if you do keep the dimming, then I do have alternative language that I can provide. But first, can we just decide if I just want to hear from others in the committee? How do you feel about separating out the dimming aspect? And would you like to still keep it in? I'll start as the unsurprising one. I'd like to keep it in. I think it's important. And I, I think that based on Mandy's uh, 
or, or considering what Mandy was talking about, 70% is still incredibly bright. Um, I think that we are maintaining safety levels. Um, and I think that we are being considerate for folks who might be traveling around on bus or um, walking or biking based on the hours that we have set. That is my, that's my perspective. Happy to hear from others. If no one else is, is um, ready, um, I'm flexible because to my understanding, the lights is like, it's not a rooted tree, meaning that they are, if they are adjustable, um, it's not set in stone. So I'm understanding that there's flexibility as to where, oh, hello, as to where um, the dimming could, could happen. So like, you know, if it's, if it is problematic somewhere, then there are areas that, you know, if, if it's not working, if it's an issue, then they wouldn't have to be dimmed if, I, if I'm understanding correctly. And also that we have, since this is such a span out with yours that we have, um, that we have some time to, to figure this out and explore it more. But I think mainly that the fact that if they can be dimmed, they can be turned up. So maybe there, you know, if there are certain areas where it's like clearly this is very high traffic and this, this doesn't work, um, then th those areas could be considered. I don't see it as something to um, delay uh, the work that, that has gone in at this point, my opinion. Can you uh, quickly confirm that Dorothy can hear and be heard before you move on? Please? Yes, Dorothy, can you hear us? Yes, I can, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Andy or anyone else, would you have something to add? Well, um, my uh, one concern I had, I think Mandy has already uh, respond, answered, and that is, um, I don't know what the cost is of the technology, but that's kind of covered in what's um, been provided. And uh, as a general principle, I think that um, if it's a not an unreasonable cost to do it, that um, it makes sense for the reasons that Mandy stated to provide the technology so that the choice can be made because otherwise we've into a whole cycle of acquisition of equipment that um, before we have the opportunity to, um, to do this. And uh, for those reasons, I'm comfortable with uh, the discussion, the way that it's gone. Okay, can I then offer the language that, because again, I have no basis to say whether 70% is enough or not, but I'm just adhering to what I think the TAC is providing. And so, uh, but I do agree with everyone and Anika, what you said that this is, there is flexibility. We don't have to dim it. Um, if you do find that this is impacting people's safety at night or they don't feel comfortable so we can always not, not dim it so there are a lot of things but i think what she was offering and i'll just read that if that's okay yeah yes. and then of course i can send it in writing if that's um if you're are you going to make an adjustment on it because it might be helpful to send it yeah, I will definitely send it, but is that something we want to discuss right now, the language or? Well, I think it should be the, with the, the sponsors, would you, would it be helpful to have it sent to you? Um, it would be helpful to have it sent. And uh, Shalini, can I clarify, do you know when um, TAC voted on this so that we can watch the recording of the meeting and understand the discussion? I think it's March 30th. So this is because so, I don't think we've seen this this language before that you're referencing. Um, no, no, I think this particular language has come from Tracy and may not be a TAC recommendation. Oh, okay, that's helpful to know um, for for what that's worth. I want to make sure we're not conflating. Not that it's not valuable. I just want to make sure we're not uh, the com if the committee hasn't voted on it. I don't want to take it as a committee recommendation. Right. No, it's not a committee recommendation. This one is coming from Tracy. Okay. And I don't know if I think as a vote, the two things that I already read are specifically from TAG, but this one is more from her side. And I think it's for our consideration if 
this is something we feel um so she's anyway i'll just read it and i'll send it to you also so she said if the section on dimming is kept and i would recommend that a the lights not be dimmed at night along major roadways in amherst especially those corridors with bus routes and or considerable late night pedestrian activity and b the lights not be dimmed in the downtown and bullet centers until at least uh midnight if not later but that you've already got it's later than it's the last bar or I was going to say that that would make it earlier than what we have it as yeah, so that yeah so that not that one but I think so just including that maybe the language that the I think if you just included that language that it would not be dimmed along major roadways not just because I I think that there's definitely some considerations there in terms of definitions of of roadways and such mm -hmm. Okay, so Shalini, you're going to send that information off. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dorothy, did you have a comment? Yeah. Um, I guess I thought we had already agreed that the lights would not be dimmed on the uh, bus route and major roadways, but maybe not, maybe not because um, certainly bus stops uh, are kind of important because people, particularly working people, have to use some of them kind of late at night and it, there should be enough lighting around there for, for safety. Um, so there was nothing in the the uh, proposed bylaw that had the, kept the lights from dimming on bus routes and major routes. There was something about downtown, right? But but not on bus routes. We have not made a um, any decision. Okay. Agreement on this. We have been trying to just go over it. So that's what we had. We're going over this today. So our sponsors um, who've been asking for questions and input and concerns yeah. gather all of this information. And then we will revisit on June 15th. Yeah. So we um, can hopefully make a uh, move on and move to action. So this is why we're taking every everyone's questions and concerns and handing them over now. Thank you. Thank you. And I just have a last set of questions, clarifications, is that um, there, these are things that I do not understand at all. And I am assuming you have spoken with DPW about these, but I just want to list them out and I will send them in writing to you again, which I'm hoping that the staff can approve specifically that these are um, approved by the staff. And again, that brings to question because I just heard that DPW is really pressed for time. So I don't know how and when they will be able to look at this. But again, I just wanted to make sure that they are approving this list of specifications, which I do not understand at all. Um, so things like number one, luminaire should be selected with the lowest possible number, ideally zero or one. P page five, streetscape lighting shall emit no more than 100 lumens of up, up light and so forth. Page five, light trespass. Um, you know, the 0 0.01 foot candle and you know all of those things, they like specifics, which I've just written down all these different specifications. Have these been um, approved by um, DPW or? DPW doesn't have an approval process for this, but we have discussed this with them and they are very, they are clear on the, on the definitions. Mm -hmm. um, to my recollection, Mindy, correct me if I'm wrong, there were not significant concerns short of if this is what you want us to do, we will figure out how to do it, um, which is the, the answer that we often get from our very willing and able staff. That's what Guilford said to me was it's doable if that's what the council decides. Okay. And he had the one concern about the lumen, the, the um, color temperature level when we had set it at 2200 and we've now moved it to 2700. Yep. Okay, so that, yeah, that's good to know. And then I think the last one we sort of touched upon, which Paul had brought up, was that uh, it's under C types of lighting fixtures. Amma shall use the most efficient and effective effective types of light fixtures when replacing or installing street lights. And if that was clear enough, what does that mean? You know, 
and I know you brought it up, but I don't remember what the answer to, to that was. Like, is that clear guidance, enough guidance to this, to the town in terms of making these purchases that it should be the most effective and efficient and effective type of lighting fixture? And where does cost and all of that feature into it? Paul might be able to answer some of that. Cost is actually the first thing mentioned in the list of factors of efficient and effective to be considered. So, but Paul, Paul might be able to answer better whether the whole thing is doable. Yeah, I think when we looked at it, the, the concern was if it's, a, if it's solely set the most efficient, we might be buying something from Switzerland or something like that. <laughs> that's super expensive and that's not what we want to be doing. But when you, you have to balance the cost versus the efficiency. And, and I think, I, I don't have it in front of me, but I think that um, the, the, um, the cost, um, the economics of it was considered as well. Yeah, it does include the factors that shall be used to determine efficiency and effectiveness include fixture cost, installation and maintenance labor, manufacturer warranty, energy use and cost, life, light quality, and the fixtures life cycle cost. So if, as long as you feel that's good, then that was all from the staff side. I just wanted to make sure that each of these specific things has been um, supported by the staff. Thank you, Shalini. Um, Anna and then Dorothy. I wanted to go back to the um, bus stops question. I think one of the things to note is that it's a bit of a Venn diagram. And so I think that it, it'll be important for us to be clear as we look at providing lighting at regional transit bus stops and recognizing that dimming is of streets, dimming is of the um, streetscape lighting. And so looking at the, looking at the crossover of those two, um, I don't, when we look at the definition, you know, I don't necessarily think all of our regional transit lighting, it would be covered under streetscape lighting. And so I think it'll just be important for us to make sure um, that it is not part of that to, to, if that's what the committee would like to make sure that the lighting at bus stops isn't, isn't um, dimmed, but Mandy might also have a thought. Yeah, so, so the second sentence is, if possible and not cost prohibitive, all other streetlights shall be dimmed to no more than 70% at 11 p.m. So, so there's, there's a couple of options we can do. We'll look at some of the language, Shalini, that you provided. We could potentially add back in the definitions of connector and arterial roads and put them as where dimming might not occur or maybe dimming to 90% or something else. Um, we could also put in similar language to what's above in the current policy about the town council makes decisions and can make exceptions specifically to the dimming of parts of town or specific corridors. There's a, a bunch of ways we can do it um, to, to deal with those concerns while also leaving dimming in. I also wanted to say the types of lighting fixtures. There was one other thing, Shalini, that you didn't read in that list, which was the ability to allow future dimming control without the need to replace the full fixture or luminaire. So that's the other spot we talk about dimming. Um, in case it's cost prohibitive to get the dimming controls, you still might want to buy the fixture that would allow the dimming controls in the future without replacing the whole fixture, things like that. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Thank you, Mandy. And Shalini, okay, Dorothy. Um, I remember a conversation, and I think that Guilford was there, when the concern was brought up that asking for the most this, the most that, could end up with the most expensive. And I thought I remembered Mandy Joe saying, or maybe it was Guilford, that they um, actually, a, a light that meets those standards was in fact a, 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 a decent cost, not, not too bad. Um, said somebody had looked at that. So I think I think Shalini's asking that that be looked at. Um, I do have a small problem with um, the statement, if this is what you want, we can do it because I've heard that from almost all town agencies because I believe that is their official position that if the town council asks it, they will do it. Um, I would want more than that from them. I would want, um, yes, and we agree it's a good idea, okay? Um, so 
I, I, obedience is nice, but really not that great. Uh, I'd rather have their strong opinion, their professional opinion uh, on some of these things. Um, and I don't know if we've had that yet. So that's kind of something I'm in interested in looking at. Yeah, Dorothy, I think that's really a question for Paul. Um, we always seek opinion and, and I think that that's really, I'm not really sure how we would necessarily force that um, without making staff really uncomfortable. So I, I guess I will defer that, that particular question to Paul. Okay. So I'm just to clarify, you want the staff to be disobedient, I guess. <laughs> no, I, I want their, their professional opinion because, yeah. you know, we so, don't, so, we're doing our best, but they're the ones that do it. Okay. Yeah, I understand that, but you, you are the policymakers and, um, you know, there's a lot of things that staff may disagree with the council on and, um, but that's not really, you know, I, I understand what you're saying in terms of their yeah. professional opinion, yeah. but yeah. I can guarantee there are things that the council does that the staff thinks are, are not good. And, but that's not, that's not really their role. Your role is to set the policy on certain things, whether it be, there's a million different topics that, that this comes up. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think, you know, getting their professional opinion, is this doable? Is this within range of what we can accomplish as a community? That's the question that we can ask. And I think what Guilford has responded is that we can, we can do this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we may have people who don't believe in climate change. They may believe in 100% climate change. You know, that's not their role. Their role is to mm -hmm. be responsive to the to what the community wants. And we've, we've had this conversation, you know, even with our police department, with every department we have, like we, we are obedient to what the community's desires are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Paul and Dorothy and to Anna and Mandy for sitting with us one more time with this. Um, you know, we may not all agree, but I hope that we can agree to make sure that if we need to read through this once again thoroughly, we do. And we send um, our questions to the sponsors and come with some preparedness, whichever that is to recommend or not on the 15th. So with that, Mandy, thank you so much for being with us. If you wanna stay for the mountain of announcements I'm going to do in like two minutes for um, June events, which are packed. Can I just jump in? Oh, I'm sorry, Paul, I didn't mean yeah. to talk to you. Go That's ahead. okay, can I just jump in for one? So I just wanna be clear at your next meeting, the expectation is that the sponsors will make a motion to approve what's in front of you, right? And for other counselors, if they would like to amend it or make an alternative motion, it's always helpful to have that in writing in advance. So everybody has a chance to read it and con contemplate it. But the way the council will act, the committee will act is by making a motion, amending it, and then ultimately settling on whatever you, either approving it or not approving it, and then communicating that back to the full council. So. What you're saying, Anika, is that next or the next meeting is decision time for this streetlight yes. thing. Yes. So if you, okay. so as uh, Paul just said, and uh, thank you for that. If you have an amendment or otherwise, it will be helpful. And again, the meeting is on the 15th. I'm happy to send this reminder. And so you can send those all ahead of time. So we're able to see them. That sound good to everyone? Okay. All right, so with that, we're going to put the street lights down until the 15th. Um, I'm going to just, if anyone else has another announcement or something, please join in. If not, I'm going to try to get this all straight for June. So tomorrow, Anna, please correct me, 1 p.m. Do we have the Pride Proclamation? Is my timing and everything else off? 4 p.m. Anything you want to add? You're muted, love. It, it happens like one in 10 times. Uh, uh, tomorrow at one is the the um, commemoration for Chief Livingstone. 4 p.m. is the Pride Proclamation. That's right. That's right. Chief Livingstone, 1 p.m., 4 p.m. And then at 4.30, the chamber has invited you to sit in some chairs that they've purchased. And there, there's some are going to be in Cushman Common. Some will be in South Amerson. There'll be one or two on the main common. So after the Pride proclamation if it's not raining uh you can walk across and sit and they want to do some photo ops there for with the counselors has invited you to sit in some chairs is possibly the funniest <laughs> thing i've heard today um also i would just like to shout that out because paul knows that i've been asking for and fight and like 
weirdly submitting resident requests to C uh, CPA for before I was on the council for Adirondack chairs on the South Amherst Common. And I'm so excited about this. I saw them today and they're beautiful. So. Aw. Uh -huh. I'm good. I've achieved, I've achieved everything I could ever hope for, even though I did nothing. It was all the town in the chamber. Well, you'll enjoy them. On June 11th, we have Race Amity Day and the AHRC Youth Awards. I believe this is ongoing from 10 a.m. through 4 p.m. and that's at Mill River. That is on the 11th. I hope I am not skipping anything in between the 11th and the 17th where we kick off Juneteenth weekend. We have the 17th, we have uh, a, a Juneteenth legacy celebration that is from 10 a.m. through 4 p.m. We have on Sunday, June 18th, we have the Amherst Cinema will be showing a free community screening, screening of a film Fences by Denzel Washington. That's at 4 p.m. A community discussion will follow at uh, 6.30 p.m. The topic of both the discussion and the film is Black Fatherhood. Um, Monday, June 19th, Juneteenth at 10 a.m. from 10, 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. You have the Mill District doing a two-part children's story reading of the book Lucky with Dr. Shirley Jackson Whitaker, at what time people will promptly be directed to go downtown to the town's Juneteenth Jubilee that starts at 12 p.m. and goes through 6 p.m. Um, the 22nd, we have a, the Senior Center is hosting a silent movie screening. Um, and this is a, um, it's, this is uh, for, a, this is a part event and this is going to be hosted by the Senior Center. Forgive me, the time has just slipped my mind, but I will make sure to send that information to everyone. And then on the 23rd of June, we have Community Safety Day, which is sponsored by the Emerson Senior Center, and that's again at Mill River Park. So I think um, those are the June events. Um, I'm sure that I, I may have forgot one or two because it's a packed month and I'll send that after. Are there any other announcements that anyone would like to make? Okay, so with that, I'll send a reminder about the streetlights policy and good night. And we will see you all on the, again on the 15th. Have a great night. Oh, sorry.